Shut up and sit down. Hey everybody, Adam back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. Thanks for tuning in this week. Great episode for you. Um, ins and outs of traditional bow hunting, kind of a comprehensive from start to finish for the beginner. So this is not this is not an in depth podcast on how to make yourself a better traditional bow hunter. It's basically traditional bow hunting, traditional archery, one hundred and one. Uh, starting with the bows and arrows and basically what you need and kind of the mindset to be in starting down the traditional archery pathway. And uh, that's exactly what we wanted to do uh, with our guest, uh, Steve Angel, the host of the Traditional Outdoors podcast. And um, I don't think it could have went any better. So uh, really excited for this episode. And please give us your feedback because we haven't really um, delved into the traditional realm just yet and uh, maybe that's not um, who we're targeting with our podcast but uh, being bow hunters um, you know that encompasses traditional archery as well and I think it is um, very alluring and and, um, you know somewhat romanticized by the history of of archery and and doing it with um, you know more primitive equipment so um, let us know what you think about this Um, Leave us a review, give us some feedback, shoot us a message on Facebook or Instagram. Um, let us know how we're doing um, with this podcast and the podcast uh, as a whole. Uh, just a couple other things. We just up- uploaded the video to our YouTube page for the scouting workshop that we did with Dan Infault. And um, so that's up. Uh, with all that information, it's kind of like almost a, a video podcast. It was so, I mean, it was four hours long, and so we just try to try to hit the the high points. It was in a blizzard. It was very cold, um, and uh, to be honest with you, when I was filming, I felt like I wasn't paying all that much attention. So I tried to uh, balance out the information for the video and uh, learning. Um, you know, on my own and, and kind of trying to take away from the, the, the workshop itself, but the video turned out pretty good and, uh, real happy with the way that it turned out. So check that out over on our YouTube, please subscribe to that. Let us know what we're doing, you know, how we're doing over there. And, um, I just want to say thank you so much to our Patreons, uh, everybody that, uh, contributes to the show monthly, um, gets in on those giveaways. Basically it's like, a a $5 raffle ticket to re- win some really uh, exciting prizes every quarter. Um, what we've got, uh, I just purchased the uh, Jason Sam Koviak uh, scouting video series uh, that we're going to be giving away to one of our Patreons, as well as um, some other things. Um, again, just not at liberty to let you know right now what we're giving away, but um, don't uh, let that hold you back. If you, know, if you like the show and you like what we're doing, you want to see some more from us, uh, definitely go over to our, our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Bowhunter Chronicles and, and check that out. You know, we appreciate that. Um, I just got some new hats and we've got shirts and everything. So I usually send out something to, to the people that are um, signed up for Patreon. I want to make sure that uh, we're giving back all the money that we get from, from Patreon. goes right back into the giveaways and into, um, you know, trying to provide better content and more content for the, the, the listeners, but most importantly, the Patreons, because those are truly the ones that, um, are supporting us directly. And so we can't say thank you enough to them. Uh, but if that's not your thing, no big deal. Like I said, just please, uh, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and tell somebody about the show. Um, you know, maybe for this episode specifically, if there's someone that you know, that's, um, been messing around with traditional archery and hasn't really dived in or or you've been thinking about it um you know uh, get together with them and say hey check this podcast out with uh with steve angel from the traditional outdoors podcast and um, it's kind of a you know tell somebody else about the show because uh, that gets us in front of more people and uh you know that's all we can ask for but uh, i think you guys are really going to enjoy this one thank you so much for tuning in enjoy the episode <laughs> Hey everybody, Adam and John back with another episode of the Bowhunter Chronicles podcast. Um, in our 
bow hunting journeys and you know we we are the bow hunter chronicles podcast we kind of don't encompass the entire breadth of bow hunting we kind of just stay in our lane and you know we've gotten outside of that a little bit with uh, our our last few guests here uh, that we've had on and and today is no different we're going to talk with steve angel from the traditional outdoors podcast and uh, we got him on the line i met him actually in the show at the show in uh in kalamazoo and uh, I've talked with him on the phone since then, and uh, he's going to kind of give us uh, traditional bow hunting 101. Um, so how are you doing tonight, Steve? Doing real well, Adam. How are you and John? Good. Doing good. So uh, let, what we'd like to do is get a little background on our, our guests and, and like the hunting style and kind of like your journey and what's what's brought you to, to, to where you're at today and kind of what that, what that in, has entailed. So uh, can you give us a little bit of a... a, a Steve Angel 101. Well, I mean that that journey could take up a, a podcast in itself, so I'll, I'll I'll try to give you a bit of a condensed version. Um, so I I grew up in a family that uh, were not hunters. My my dad really didn't care much about anything other than uh, the farm that I grew up on. But you know, as as early as I can remember, uh, I had a I was just drawn to being in the woods and I guess it probably started, um, you know, through magazines. That was pretty much the only, the only, um, view I had at the time. And I pretty much just bothered my, my father to the point he finally broke down and bought me a bow for my, my 16th birthday. It was a, uh, it was a compound. It was pretty much, he, he went to a local shop and, you know, that's what they put in his hand. And that's what I started out with. And, you know, I, pretty much committed to myself that I wasn't going to hunt with anything else until I managed to take a, a deer with that bow, which took a few years, um, but managed to, I think it was like the second, uh, the second full hunting season. I, I managed to shoot a, a little five point. And, um, from there, you know, I, I, I started gun hunting a little bit. I hunted with black powder. I, I mean, it, if it's legal, I've probably shot a projectile from it at some point at a whitetail. Um, <laughs> but the, you know, the black powder, I fell in love with that for a while. Um, you know, hunting with rifles, I enjoyed, but it became one of the, and a lot of people go through this, right? It was, I wasn't so concerned with um how close I could get a whitetail with a rifle. It was about, you know, how, how far can I accurately make a shot kind of thing over the years. I mean, that wasn't, you know, my initial, uh, my initial thought on, on rifle hunting, but that at some point transformed into hunting with handguns, which I did for many years, everything from, um, 44 Magnum revolvers all the way up to, you know, specialized single shot, long range handguns. And at some point, I guess about 17, 18 years ago, um, I, I really just got to the point where I wanted more of a challenge and ended up trying a, a recurve that led to shooting a longbow. And once I took my first whitetail with a, a longbow, I just had no desire to, to pursue them with anything else. And pretty much I sold all of my, my hunting firearms. I've still got some personal protection firearms. And I love to get out and shoot, but... I just really have no desire to pursue them with anything but my longbow and every now and then a recurve. And so we talked about this a little bit at the show, but um, one of the questions that I have is, um, you know, why recurves or why traditional archery? Um, It seems, and I know that you, you're really ingrained in the, in the culture of uh, the traditional uh, bow hunters. Um, but from the outside looking in, it kind of seems like an elitist group of people um, on some level. I can tell you that, you know, myself going into that show, um, you know, it, it, it's a good like learning tool, but you never know who you're talking to. Um, and it was very um, overwhelming because there was so much to see and, um, not knowing anything about it, you know, it, it was just kind of like a, a, a shut up and listen type, type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what do you think is the culture of, of traditional bow hunting, you know, right now? And, uh, why do you think many people 
ha- are going that way. Because if you look at social media, there's been in recent years kind of it's kind of like the cool thing to do, and that's kind of why personally I've shied away from it just to not be a bandwagon jumper guy. Sure, sure. So first, I'll I'll I want to go back to one thing that you said because this is something I've talked about on on our podcast multiple times, and that's the the elitist term that that gets thrown about quite a bit. Um, you know, I could sit here and tell you a lot of reasons why some of that happens. Uh, quite frankly, I think some of it is just because you know sometimes people don't hear the answer that they want to hear, so you know they they recoil and and you know elitist is something that comes out I, saying that doesn't mean there aren't people in the traditional community that you know aren't i don't i hate the word elitist but i'll just say that they're <laughs> they're very opinionated let me give it let me put it that way um and a lot of us admittedly you know we we are we are traditional bow hunters because we have a certain i don't know m- I, there's a lot of words that get thrown around and I don't like most of them, but we just have a certain attitude. Let me put it that way. The way we, you know, the way we want to approach bow hunting. And when I say that, I'm saying the vast majority, um, you know, and a lot of times some of these elitist things that get thrown around are simply because people come into a, uh, a community that is, identified as traditional bow hunting and start you know tossing around photos and and you know hunting pictures that were clearly not with with compounds and then as soon as somebody says wait a minute this is a traditional group why are you posting that here oh you're a bunch of elitists and they get mad and leave i mean that's a very common thing that happens i guess um so again i don't i don't like the term there are some people that wear that elitist thing with a bad bad, like a badge of honor um but as a whole and i think you you probably saw a good bit of this at the expo the majority of the people in the traditional bow hunting community are they're just you know salt of the earth people they'll do pretty much anything they can to help you um i i i've put a, a long bow or recurve in the hands of a lot of guys that were shooting um modern equipment but I don't look down on anybody that's shooting modern equipment uh, for all intents and purposes. If if somebody's hunting with a, a compound, I hunted with one for many years myself. I've, I'll do anything I can to help them be successful, regardless of the weapon they're shooting. And what I have found over the years is that sort of attitude goes a lot further to bring somebody into the traditional community as an archer or as a bow hunter than, you know, putting them down or, or throwing insults their way because they chose to shoot a, a modern bow. So I don't know. I kind of probably danced all around your, your specific question, but I hope I kind of covered the points. Sure. And, and I mean, just to try and explain like the, that, that expo, because again, it's, it, it was foreign to me, but it, um, it seems more, I guess, important than I guess I really realized. That's it's a pretty big expo as far as nationally. I mean, you came up from Georgia. Aaron mm-hmm. Snyder was there. I mean, South Cox. You know, there was uh, a lot of people in that building that were, you know, not from from Michigan or or, or anywhere local. Sure. It and and it, I mean, it is. I, I guess it's probably recognized as the you know uh, the largest North American. Uh, traditional bow hunting venue there is I, I i i guess you'd call it an expo but i mean they have you know they have a ton of vendors there they have a ton of speakers which i i really kind of hated i didn't get to to sit down and, and listen to any of the uh, the speaking sessions they have but um you know that this year was my first trip as well so i was kind of seeing it for the first time but i've been to a lot of other shows you know there's another one that um you might want to think about attending in june that occurs in Berrien springs that's uh, compton's traditional bow hunters puts on uh, it's a, a three-day rendezvous it's you know shooting and vendors and the whole nine yards and i guarantee you if you if you've got a trad bow and want to show up and shoot you'll have a blast it's a it's a very fun event yeah i had uh one of the guys at our club was was talking about that because he's built like 
23, I think, self bows. And he's like, yeah, if you go to Compton, you know, you just got to show up and they'll let you borrow their tools and the whole works. And they're up till three, four in the morning, just making bows, you know, around the campfire or whatever. Sure. It's like, oh man. Um, so, um, what would you say is the average age of the traditional bow hunter? Because I, I, I've got my own theory on the average age in that building that day. <laughs> and the trad bow hunter, yeah. you mean? Yeah. Trad bow hunter. Um, you know, I'll be honest. I would hate to put a, I would have to hate to put a number on that. I, and I say that because, um, there's, I mean, there's, there's every age you can imagine out there participating in a lot of the shoots that I go to. So, there's everything mm -hmm. from, from, you know, kids that you would think wouldn't even be able to, to hold a bow, much less shoot it, you know, all the way up to us, us old timers. So, <laughs> um, and, and I really, do, I, I, it's like I said, it's hard for me to put a number on. I, if I had to guess, I would say probably 50, maybe, I, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. That was, that was my guess. Do you think it takes people a, a lot, is it longer progression? They have to go through kind of the, the steps that you outlined a little bit to figure out like what, what kind of where they fall. Do you think it's part of the, the hunting journey or is it, um, you know, so we talked to, to Jim Eck out on the, on the, on our podcast and he said he, you know, the, basically from the first time he shot a bow, he saw a guy shooting a traditional bow and was like, well, why do I need all this other stuff on my bow? And then that was kind of like in the transition period between compound and, in recurve or you know in traditional and he just stuck with it since then so is it a a combination of the two do you think i think it's i think it's different for different people um you know nick view my co-host uh, he's never he's never hunted with a, a modern bow and he i don't know nick's age i probably should but he's a lot younger than i am uh, but he's never he's never hunted with a compound i would tell you that for me I had to take the journey, but the journey was really more where I started and the conditions with where I started than, than anything else. And the reason I say that, even, even when I was, you know, 16, 17 years old, to me, bow hunting was, it was more personal. It was more intimate. It wasn't, it wasn't, and we'll probably end up talking about some of this, even when I hunted with a compound for, for, uh, Again, I'd have to sit down and do the math, but let's just say for our argument's sake, 25 years. And it's probably a little bit longer than that. Um, I never shot at a whitetail over 30 yards. Just had no desire to do so. Could I shoot further than that? Yes. But there was a lot of reasons I never, I never took shots at animals over 30 yards. The primary two being, one... I wanted to be up close. That was that was what bow hunting was to me. It it just wasn't a long range game. And two, even the speeds of modern compounds, personally, I just believe there's way too many factors once you get beyond that thirty that thirty yard mark to be sending arrows at a at a at an animal. Um, or let me rephrase that at a whitetail. Uh, I think you know there are some animals I've taken hogs at. 40 yards elk i might take shots at 30 plus with even with a trad bow maybe uh it would just depend on how confident i felt but uh, you know it so it wasn't moving from a, a compound bow to a, a traditional bow wasn't that big of a difference for me as far as from a hunting perspective i lost 10 yards uh it was really more learning how to shoot and learning how to make the shot with a traditional bow versus a, a modern bow because I don't have the benefits of, of let off. I don't have the benefits of drawing, you know, before the animal comes into, uh, into my shooting lane. Uh, you know, I have to, I have to draw and shoot pretty much at the same time. And therefore I've got to be more concerned about where the animal's facing, how it's looking, what the angle is of the, you know, the animal in relation to where I am. Is it going to see me drawing? Is it going to see the movement? So there's a lot of things I had to learn to do differently uh, in, in conjunction with actually learning how to shoot without, you know, sights and those kind of things. And so uh, to build upon that, let's say that somebody's 
get ready to start or is interested in in making that the leap or or, or just start to play around with it um let's start from a, an equipment standpoint um what is i mean where would you start what is recommended what's the differences between longbows recurves reflex deflex etc cetera, etc cetera? Well, and that's, honestly, that's one of those questions you ask 10 people, you're probably going to get 10 different answers. So I'll just, I'll give you kind of my take on it. Um, Mm -hmm. If you're wanting to try it out, and this is, this is a question that comes up on social media all the time. The first thing I would tell anybody is try to find a local traditional group, whether it's a, a local club like we have here that shoots once a month, or maybe it's a, you know, a national organization that might have a shoot coming up in two months. Um, if you can go to these things, you're going to find people that will let you shoot a lot of different bows. And that's the only way you're going to find what shoot, what you shoot well and what feels good to you. And I'll give you a prime example of myself. When I started out, I, I bought a recurve. Um, and I can't remember exactly why I bought a recurve, but that's what I chose to start with. And I did find, and it may have even been suggested to me at the time, Going from a, a compound to traditional gear, a recurve, while it's not going to be as fast as a, as a compound, it's closer. It's not going to be, um, you know, as noticeable as going to a longbow. And also, most recurves kind of, the, the grip design, the riser, they feel a lot like a modern bow. Um, and I can't remember where along my journey somebody suggested that I go to this local club that I've been a member of now for almost as long as I've been shooting traditional equipment and try some different bows out. And the first time I picked up and shot a longbow, it was like, you know, the 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 sun came out and the angels were singing. It was just a, <laughs> it, it, it was what I had expected and what people had communicated I should be feeling with the recurve, which I just never felt like I was consistent with. But as soon as I started shooting a longbow, it, you know, everything kind of came into focus. I, I was I was hitting where I was looking. Um, I, I, my confidence soared. What's funny is after shooting longbows all these years, now I can pick up a recurve and shoot it just fine. But at that time when I was trying to learn, I just couldn't I couldn't get it to to work for me. So you know, I would recommend it people if they can get out and shoot a lot of different bows and feel figure out what is is best for them. If that's just not an option, you know, search, um, search forum, search uh, Facebook. Try to find a used bow in a low weight. If you're if you're shooting a compound, you know, you need to reduce the weight that you're shooting with a, a traditional bow by at least fifty percent, probably by sixty or seventy percent, um, because it's just it's so much different than shooting a modern bow. You're your um your draw cycle and the weight that you're feeling it's completely opposite instead of having a real sharp start with a let off you've got uh uh, the bow actually increases in weight as you as you pull it back so once you get to full draw you're holding the full weight um and it's a it's just a big difference uh and i'm a proponent of heavier bows and that's a whole nother discussion but still when you're starting out you need to shoot something light um and then you just need some arrows i mean that's a science in itself, but for the average person that's just starting out, if you, you know, if you buy a bow that's 25, 30 pounds, then, uh, you should be able to re you know, contact like three rivers or there's uh, custom King and they can give you a good idea of what arrow should shoot. Okay. From that bow. And then as you get better, then you can get into the science of understanding spine and, and matching spine and, and, uh, tuning arrows to the bow because that's a that's a whole nother process and we had some questions from uh some of our patreons and and some some listeners who we had asked about you know what questions did they have about traditional archery and and that was one of the main ones so it sounds like a lot of people have taken that first step and they've got a bow and now it's the arrows and how to set them up and and what you know cedar arrows carbon arrows um uh, all of that what i guess where do you where do you start and one thing i was surprised at when i was looking at um i mean i guess i just looked at my spine charts for for compounds and i thought okay well this is a 50 pound bow i'm going to need this arrow or this arrow but 
it's that's not necessarily the case. There is a, a completely different spine chart for traditional because they're not traveling at the same speeds, right? Not traveling at the same speeds, but that that's really less about the spine than than anything else. So, with a compound, again, it goes back. Part of it goes back to that power cycle. You get, you know, you you've got that let off the cams engage. You've got this huge thrust of energy, and you know that's going to affect the way that arrow goes through paradox. The other thing that you've got with compounds is you've got true center shot, so you don't necessarily have to force that arrow to bend to clear the riser like you do with traditional gear. Um, and I hope this is, ma- is this making sense or do I need to explain yeah, it better? I, <laughs> no, I've got John over here. Who's the, our, you know, you're, you're on the arrow building and string making. Okay. Uh, traditional side. John's the arrow building, string building compound guy. So I'm just <laughs> watching his eyes and he's following. So I've, I'm tracking. <laughs> okay, so so when you go to a traditional bow, you've got a lot more things that you have to consider in conjunction with the the different power cycles, the different amount of thrust that the string applies to the arrow when you when you release the bow or release the string. Um, so you have to take into consideration the the depth of the cut on the riser. In many cases, a lot of modern uh, recurves, especially recurves that have metal risers um, or non-wood risers, they're they're pretty much going to be cut past center, and it it almost gets into that compound realm where it's a lot more forgiving with regards to to spine. Um, if you're shooting long bows, especially this style long bow that I shoot, and if I showed uh, showed you a picture of the bow that I've hunted with for the last four or five years, it's it almost has no shelf. So the the bows that I shoot predominantly have a very shallow shelf and they're not cut anywhere near to center um, the bow that I hunt with right now the the shelf on that bow might be an eighth of an inch deep so there's there's a lot of bow that that arrow has to has to flex around which is called archer's paradox it's the the arrow has to bend to get around the bow um, if you've anybody that's ever watched the movie Brave with their kids, that is probably one of the few times Hollywood ever got anything right when the, the little girl releases the arrow and, and it puts everything in slow motion and you get to see that arrow flex and bend around the shaft. That's what you're looking for with a traditional bow. That's what you've got to tune your arrows for. Because if the arrow is contacting the riser in any way, once you release, it's going to affect the flight of that arrow. It's either going to cause the, the arrow to kick out uh, too far to the left if you're a right-handed shooter. To, so it's, oh, it's weak spine, which means it's flexing too much, or it's too stiff and it doesn't clear the riser enough and it, the riser almost acts as a ramp and can send it you know, the wrong direction. Um, and then you have to factor in you know broadhead tuning and all that stuff, which... One thing I will say, and and I've, I've I've said this many times, if you tune the arrow correctly and you get the arrow properly tuned, the broadhead really doesn't matter. Um, and I can't tell you how many people have argued that with me. And I shoot um, the the arrows that I have spined for the longbow that I've hunted with for the last four years now. I can mount uh, three to one ratio tough heads or grizzlies. I can mount uh, inch and a half inch wide um, Magnus Classics, 160 grain Magnus Classics, and I can mount two and a quarter inch wide Simmons Tree Sharks. As long as I've got the same point weight on all of those, on the same arrow, they all fly to the same point of impact. They all shoot the same. But you you have to do the work to get the arrow tuned properly for the bow. And so when you're doing that, what what is the the tuning process? Because that's another, I mean, you you and John both being string guys and me following along with what, what John does. I mean, like last week, he shaved his beard, so he had to completely deconstruct his bow because he had a left hair and had to shim the cam. And, and uh, I mean. That hurts. Things that, 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 <laughs> that normal people don't do. Right. Right. So I, I understand a bit of that. Um, and then when he's, you know, adding twists to strings and, and, and removing twists and, and doing things like that, 
Uh, how is the tuning and what is that process like on a, a traditional bow? Because, I mean, if you remove the string, it's going to twist and then there's that can change the brace height and all different things with with a, a, a I mean, it, it seems like you would get simpler because there's less parts and less things. But it seems to me almost more there, more variables because every time that you un, that you unstring that bow, there's a chance that when you string it back up, it doesn't go back the same way. Um, okay. So in some ways we're talking about two different things. One is bow tuning and one is arrow tuning, even though they both kind of come together to, to right, achieve right. the same result. So, and I, the, I'll just tell you the way I go about it. The way I go about it is I, if I've got arrows that, that I feel like are pretty close to the bow, I'll get out and shoot. I'll watch the arrow flight. Um, and I'll adjust the brace height as needed to get the to where I feel like the bow is shooting the best it can with a specific arrow. And then I start my my arrow tuning process. And that really starts out um most of the bows that I've had I've had them long enough that you know I pretty much know what's going to work within within reason meaning I can I can, if I know what my point weight's going to be then I pretty much know what spine I need to start with and I will build just a bare shaft um, build the front end the way it, that I'm intending for that specific setup, and then I'll go out and shoot. And depending on how the arrow impacts the target without fletching, it's bare shaft tuning, right? If 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 I need to um, stiffen the arrow, then I'll come in and I'll start cutting from the back of the arrow um, until I get the shaft stiff enough that it's that it's flying like it should be. If it's flying too weak, I typically go up in spine and start over again. Um, but usually, I pretty much know where the bow is going to shoot um, from a from a brace height perspective. Uh, but again, I, in my personal opinion, the bows that I shoot and that I hunt with the most are much less finicky. And when I say much less finicky, typically, um, I use the what's called the fist mill method, which is just taking my make a basically make a fist with my thumb extended, place the the meat of my fist against the riser. And then I adjust the string to where it's just above the tip of my thumb. And in most cases, these straight limb bows that I shoot, that's going to be about perfect. Uh, recurves and and hybrid long bows can be a bit more finicky, um, but I just I don't shoot them all that much. Yeah, like I say, it, for for me, this is like fascinating, just in a sense of I've I've seen now over the past few years the way that John breaks these bows down and explains it and, and everything but like walking into that show and seeing i mean first of all the energy in the building you know everybody's running around i've never i mean i've never been to a show where they just hand you the bow and say yeah go shoot it and come back and tell me what you think grab another one um you know so that's a, another opportunity to to sit down and, and i guess to get an opportunity to listen from the manufacturer what the differences are about one model versus the other and, and then actually shoot them but then just like anything else i feel like that could be a, a thing where all things being equal in the store it's it's great or you know when you purchase it it's it's awesome and then you go home and then it, everything falls apart and you're like why isn't this the way that it <laughs> it was so um it, it, we had a lot of questions about about the arrows and and tuning and and, and things like that so um i, I guess what are your recommendations for guys as they start out and as they start down that arrow tuning process? Well, that's so that's going to change a bit depending on what shaft material they're they're choosing to to shoot. If if somebody contacted me and told me they you know what they wanted to shoot carbons and they could tell me the bow weight that they're shooting, you know, I can pretty much tell them where they're going to need to start within reason. Um without being able to reach out to somebody, I would just say, you know, there's, um, there's a couple different, uh, spine charts that you can find online. Three rivers has one. Uh, there's a, there's another one that you can actually go and download. That's a spreadsheet. And I want to say it's uh Stu Miller. I haven't used it in a long time. So that may, may be uh, a little off, but it's a, it's a spreadsheet that you can download that you can actually plug things in like, uh, the bow weight, um, how far from from cut to center the bow is, the style of bow, 
uh, the point weight that you're wanting to shoot. And it can get you pretty close. Um, and the reason I say it'll get you pretty close, nothing is going to tell you definitively what spine you, you need because everybody shoots just a little bit different. And if you're really trying to fine tune everything, then there's going to be some differences. Um, wood tends to be a little more forgiving. So you can, you know, you can get away with, um, you know, say you're shooting a, a, a 45 pound recurve. There's a good chance that you're going to be able to go and buy a pair, a set of 45, 50 spine wood arrows, and it's going to shoot pretty good. Um, the carbons are a bit different. And, and one of the reasons that they're different is because they recover from paradox a lot faster than, than a wood shaft. So they're a bit more finicky, but at the same time, um, I tend to think that, that, uh, a set of 400 spine arrows can work in a lot of different traditional bows. It's not, you know, they're not, you, you don't have as many options. So you have to figure out other ways to tune a carbon versus a, a wood arrow with a wood arrow. You can just go up and down in spine by five pounds with a carbon. You're stuck with, you know, uh, 700, 600, 500, 400, 350 or 340s and, and 300 spines. So you get into having to, you know, play around with the, the length versus the amount of point weight. Um, you can even do things like adding weight to the back of the of a carbon arrow to increase, uh, to modify the spine. So I would just say wood arrows are going to be a lot more forgiving and probably easier for somebody that's just getting started. Um, but there are, there are tools out there to find, you know, to get you close. And when I say close, it's going to get you close enough that you should be able to get out and start shooting and, and at least get to where you can, you, you can hit a target. You can hit what you're looking at to, you know, 10, 15 yards without a whole lot of headache. Now, one thing without going down a giant rabbit hole and uh, blowing up the internet and podcasting communities <laughs> and everything like that. Um, what is, I guess, would you say is like an average arrow weight? Um, you know, because we, we, we talked heavy arrows on a previous podcast for, um, for compounds and, and in the traditional community, you know, generally speaking, they shoot heavier arrows because all of the things have to work together and they're not going quite as fast. So you want more penetration. Generally speaking, heavier arrow means more penetration. What should, should guys building arrows at, at that, at this juncture, if, as they're just starting out, be concerned about all of these things that are buzzing around about high FOC, high, you know, arrow weight in general. Okay. So we're kind of talking about, Again, two different things here. Um, for, so first of all, when we're when we're talking about just getting started shooting traditional gear, um, mm -hmm. I would say it doesn't matter. Find an arrow that flies well out of the bow and learn to shoot. Don't. Who cares? As long as you, as long the only thing I would say that matters there is that you're shooting an arrow that is heavy enough um, that it's it's not and I'll say violating the bow's warranty, but even if you're shooting a, a, a an older bow, it's more about what the bow was designed to shoot. So, you you know, you don't want to take a bow and start, you know, shooting arrows that weigh, I don't know, five grains per pound. When I say that, I'm saying if you're shooting a 40-pound a bow, you don't want to shoot a 200-grain a arrow. It, it It's too light. The 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 mass weight of the arrow has to absorb some of the energy from that bow and if you're shooting an arrow that's too light you've got a lot of wasted energy and the bow actually ends up absorbing that and it can damage the bow so you know try to understand what either the average uh grain per pound should be for a recurve versus a long bow or what the person who built that bow recommends and let's say that's eight grains per pound uh well then if you've got a uh 40 pound bow then you need to be shooting an arrow that's what 480 grains is that right you get my idea 40 pound 40 times eight that's the weight arrow you should be shooting or heavier just because you don't want to damage the bow but this is a bow hunters chronicles podcast so now we'll talk <laughs> about hunting um 
so you know even in it doesn't matter it, it, and and i still i still know a lot of guys that are you know modern uh bow hunters compound hunters and and i follow a lot of these groups and it, again if you ask 10 people you're gonna get 10 answers um i've shot light arrows in the past um and i've had poor results you typically don't have to show me a failure but once and i learn or or i try to figure out what i can do and do it better and and this comes up quite a bit and if you if you'd like i can tell you what i what i hunt with um but every time somebody starts um giving negative feedback about the setup that i'm shooting and why i shoot what i do and there was even a, a comment made at the expo. I'm not sure exactly who did it, but one of the, I know in one of the sessions, and it doesn't matter, right? Everybody's got their own opinion and they're, they're entitled to it. But the statement was something to the effect of, you know, are you hunting, are you going to be hunting uh, Cape Buffalo? And then, you know, neither am I, so we don't need to worry about EFOC. So that's that's just not a I, I don't know I, I completely disagree with that statement and again I don't know who made it it just came to me secondhand and it possibly wasn't even said but um, whenever somebody questions me the first thing I'll say is I have never lost an animal because I got too much penetration not one time but I can tell you numerous times that I lost an animal because I didn't get enough years ago. It hasn't been any time recent. It's been 20 plus years ago. And I can definitely tell you animals that I have recovered that I would not have recovered had I not had the arrow set up that I have. Um, you know, the, the other argument that you always, arrow placement is everything. And I agree with you 110%. However, you're not shooting at stationary targets. You're not shooting at foam. You're shooting at a live animal in in circumstances where anything can happen. And if I can shoot a, a, you know, a inch and a half or even a two and a half, two and a quarter inch wide head, and I can shoot an arrow that's got high FOC and I know I'm going to get the penetration I need. A lot of times that can be the margin of error. If something happens from the time you, you, your mind tells you to let that string go and the arrow reaches the target. Um, so, Make the decision for yourself, but when I say that, I would say do the research, read, try to understand. Don't just do it for one because somebody told you you didn't need to, and two, don't do it because you don't want to spend the the time trying to figure it out if you want to be successful and go into the woods with the best odds that you can. If you decide it's not for you, great. I, you know what? I'll I'll pat you on the back. I'll wish you the best of luck, and and I'll do everything I can to help you be successful. But don't just discount it because you feel like it's a waste of time. Um, there have been numerous studies done that show higher FOC, three to one ratio broadheads, single bevel broadheads, all this stuff. It it will increase penetration, which is critical in many cases to reach in the vitals. Not every animal is going to be standing perfectly broadside. And in fact, in the traditional world, in very few situations do you want that animal standing perfectly broadside because there's a much greater chance that he's going to catch you before you can release that arrow. I like quarter and away shots. I like steep quarter and away shots. And if I can and have done so, if I can put an arrow in in front of the the the, the left ham and break the right shoulder and get a full pass through and puncture the vitals, that's the arrow I want to be hunting with. I don't want to be passing up shots because I didn't feel like I had the equipment to do the job. And you can't do that with a light arrow. And I just went on a what? tear there that you said you didn't want to go down a rabbit hole. So I'll, <laughs> I'll hush for a minute and let you guys talk. <laughs> Oh, I mean, no, that, that is a, a great answer. I mean, it kind of goes along with the other, like the other podcast and kind of the, the, the other discussions that we've had. But I think the key in there was when you're just starting out, it doesn't matter. And my, my point in asking that question was when you start taking these things more seriously and so i think when you when you're starting to build your your bow and, and you're starting to learn and you're you, there's so many distractions out there 
of, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And there's so much buzz right now about air weights and FOC and everything like that. Um, that's that, that's kind of the answer that I wanted was that it doesn't matter. Just find something that's going to shoot and be able to shoot it well and, and be on target. And then once you figure out that you can actually shoot the bow, you're going to stick with it. You want to hunt with it. Then you can kind of move into that building a, a hunting arrow setup, you know? And so. I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, it, uh, if you're looking to get into traditional archery, get a bow, get some arrows that are safe to shoot from that bow and get out and shoot. The, the, the last thing you need to do is get, you know, the, the wire wrapped around the axle because you're trying to figure out all these different factors that really don't matter yet. Here's the thing. If you can't hit a whitetail at 10 yards, it doesn't matter what kind of arrow you're shooting. <laughs> so, you know, l- learn to shoot, learn the mechanics. Um, and, you know, then when you would then when you're planning to go into the woods, that's when you need to stop and say, OK, is the arrow that I'm shooting adequate to do the job on a whitetail in most cases if you're shooting an arrow that matches your bow you're probably going to be fine if it's on the light side then you may just have to have the uh the fortitude to limit shots to only shots that you know you're not going to contact any bone um and that's then that's fine there's nothing wrong with that i can tell you I've, I've, I've put a lot of animals on the ground that I wouldn't have if, if that had been my, if that was my limitation, which is why I, I just don't like it. So, uh, I shoot, I shoot different equipment for that reason. And I'm not talking about taking unethical shots, you know, quartering toward shots. Never in my wildest dreams would I ever take a, a quartering to or a facing to me shot with a, a traditional bow, but quartering away. And knowing I'm going to hit bone and being able to shatter bone, I'm no problem with it whatsoever. But again, I wouldn't do it if I was shooting a, a 450 grain arrow. So, Steve, it's like you almost have a podcast and you work through these transitions on a regular basis. Um, so you've built these, you've got the bow, you've got the arrows. They're all shooting through paper where, you know, they're hitting the same spot. They're 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 going going well. Now, how the hell do you hit what you're aiming at? And what are the different methods or like, where would you tell somebody to start um, as far as that? Uh, and I, my father-in-law would be a good example of he's telling me, you know, cause I, I did sit on, on some of those seminars at the, at the expo and there was one about aiming and uh, I was telling him kind of like my synopsis and he's like, well, that's not, you know, that you're not, that's not traditional. You're supposed to just instinctually shoot. <laughs> um, so how do you hit what you're aiming and where would you point guys towards um, becoming better um, archers with traditional equipment? Okay. Um, Wow. There's a lot there. Uh, So as far as aiming methods, I don't know that I'm, I'm all that good at giving you aiming methods. I, I do have a way that I can, um, that I've recommended that I've gotten really good feedback on and I'll, I'll give you that in just a minute. But, um, instinctive versus reference shooting. So let's tackle that one first. So, you know, there are traditional bows out there that even, even back in the, I don't know, sixties and seventies, they had sights on them. So, you know, I don't believe in putting sights on a traditional bow, but it's really more about, I don't need them. And to me, they just get in the way as it is uh, one of those, that's not traditional things. Get out of here with that crap. I don't, as long as somebody's out there doing what they enjoy, I, you know, I'm not going to tell them to stop because it doesn't fit in the, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. It just doesn't matter. But I will tell you this, once you learn to shoot uh, instinctively or semi-instinctively, you, 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 you're not going to want the sights and so forth in your way. It's just, it's, it's so much more freeing to be able to shoot at what you're looking at and hitting it. Um, that said, I call myself an instinctive shooter. A lot of other people call themselves instinctive shooters, and then they'll, you know, they'll start again ruffling their feathers when people are talking about string walking and and reference points and using the tip of the air and all this stuff. Here's what I'll tell you: even an instinctive shooter, their mind is still doing all of those same things. They're just not 
consciously focusing on it. So it, it again, it's a it, it's a it's a mute argument in my humble opinion. That said, I shoot a lot. Um, I don't ever look at a target and mentally go, I think that's X yards. I look at the target. My mind goes through the calculation. What, where, do, where, does, where does my hand that's on that bow need to be so that when I release this arrow, the arc of the arrow is going to cause it to intersect with that target where it's standing now. And all that happens very quickly. And if honestly and truly, if I sit there and think about it too long, or I start thinking about it, I'm going to miss. It just, it doesn't work that way. Um, that said, somebody just starting out, this is the best advice that I can give you. Um, get you a target and, and have a target with a backstop that's large enough that it's safe. Have a, a point of impact target point, whether that's a bullseye on the target or whether you draw a circle on the target, whatever it needs. This is the spot I want to hit with my arrow when I release it. Now, underneath that, and let's say start out, because this changes depending on how close you are to the target, but if you're seven yards from the target, put another spot on that same target, maybe 10 inches below the spot you want to hit. You with me? Yep. That's your reference point. And whether that's the the point of the arrow or maybe it's the top of your knuckle, whatever feels comfortable with you, when you pull that, I mean the top of your hand, not your knuckle, when you pull that bow back, you're focusing on the target you want to hit. But in your peripheral vision, you're lining something up. Whether it's the point of the arrow, which is usually the most common, you're lining that up with that bottom spot on the target. And then you release and see where it hits. If it's high, move it target, move that that lower spot down. If it's if it's too low, you want to bring that lower spot back up. That just gives you a reference point to start consistently holding the bow in the same place each time when you release. I don't like that to become a crutch. Once you get where you're you're constant, you're fairly consistent that you're hitting where you're looking at. Get rid of that dot and stop using it. But that'll give you a good way of knowing and let your, your mind, the computer between your shoulders, start building that memory and that muscle memory of what it takes for that to happen. Um, then once, you, once you're doing that and you're having fun, the second thing that I tell people to do um, is what I call blind bail shooting. So again, you need a target that's big enough and a backstop that makes everything safe. And you're getting fairly close to the target, five ten yards. I excuse me, five to seven yards. I've been shooting twenty almost twenty years, and I still do this on a regular basis. Pick one part of your form and execution that you want to work on that day, and that's what you're going to be doing while you're doing this blind bail. And it's you know five to six arrows. Look at the spot on the target. Get your your bow up just like you're ready to shoot. Any other, any other time that you're going to shoot and you're ready to start the shot execution and close your eyes. Draw the bow, anchor the bow, focus on your back tension and release without ever opening your eyes. Now, again, do this in a safe, in a safe situation. <laughs> but what that, what that does is it takes your eyes out of the equation. Everything that can distract you and disrupt the shot as you're taking it is out of the equation and you can focus on that one piece of your shot execution. Maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, how you're holding your bow arm. Maybe it's um, how you're hitting your anchor point. Maybe it's the release, whatever that may be. That's what you're focusing on. And you'll be surprised if you do that on a regular basis, as you start getting better where you're shooting, you'll be surprised how consistently you can put arrows in a target, even with your eyes closed, may not hit the bullseye, but the arrows will be in the same place. Um, and it just, again, it, it, it starts building that foundation for shot execution that's so important because within reason, you you need to do the same thing every time um, in order to be consistent with your shooting. Again, I say that with a grain of salt because I don't, personally, I don't, I don't necessarily follow or, or adhere to that. And that's one of the reasons I shoot the style bow that I shoot is a lot of times I'm shooting in awkward angles, awkward positions. I'm I'm leaning off of a tree stand or a saddle. I'm I'm pivoting and shooting behind where I can't come to full draw. And 
again, I, I, I practice these things enough that it just, the mental computer takes over. It's not so much of standing perfectly, you know, square to your target, your feet positioned exactly right and all that stuff. That's more to me of a, a tournament archer or a, a field archer. And I think in most situations, guys that get out bow hunting are eventually are going to run into situations where they just can't do that. So they, they have to learn how to adjust if they want to take those shots. And so for, for guys that want to then start, start bow hunting, uh, with traditional gear, as you progress through that, what would you say is the, the commitment to the, the traditional equipment? One of the things that I fear of, and I've told like one of my buddies who like grew up hunting traditional equipment is that I fear that if I get into it and I, I, it seems like the commitment is, you know, you need to shoot every day. You need to, you know, basically become like one with the bow, I guess. Um, but is that, I don't think that I would, I would, I would have a, have trouble going back and forth between them and I, that I wouldn't ever pick up my compound again. And he said, Oh no, that that's not true. And you could just use it for, you know, start off with small game or something like that. Um, as far as, uh, you know, the, what is the commitment that it takes to switch over to, to become a hunter with traditional equipment? Would you say? Well, uh, like everything else, you're going to get out of it, what you put into it. Um, unfortunately that's just the, that's the nature of the beast, right? Here's the, here's the flip side of that though. If, if you, again, we get back to that discipline thing. If you're disciplined enough to get to the point where you can consistently hit, um, uh, an eight inch target at 10 yards, go hunting, but don't shoot past 10 yards. That's where you typically get into the rub with people wanting or saying they want to switch over to traditional um, that are currently shooting compounds or maybe they want to try both. You know, you're, and I don't know what, I honestly don't know what the average um, or what the maximum shot for a, a compound bow is today. For me, it would still be 30 yards. Again, for those same reasons that I stated. I know a lot of people are shooting farther than that. Uh, and that's their choice. But if they're shooting, let's say that they're set up and they're ready prepared any day of the week to take a 50-yard shot on a whitetail. Well, you just cut that that range by more than half. If you are, if you're well practiced, you shoot a lot. You know you can hit your target consistently. Again, I wouldn't shoot over 20 yards with a with a, a traditional bow at a whitetail. Um, I've taken pronghorn at you know, near 30, just under 30, but that's a different animal. They don't, they don't react the same as a whitetail. Um, so, you know, it, it, to me, it comes down to what are your, what are your goals? What are your expectations? If you want to get out and hunt and you're, you're happy with getting set up and not taking a shot more than 10 yards, then get to the point where you can shoot 10 yards and, and shoot it enough to stay consistent of that. If you're really wanting to get out and bow hunt and you really want to make an effort at it, then you're going to have to shoot enough to get that distance out to 20. And that's going to take a little bit more time. How much time is different for for everybody? Um, When I first started, I shot and had to shoot a lot. And I still probably shoot almost daily, um, almost daily. But I do it now because I enjoy it. I love watching the flight of the arrow. I love feeling the... Um, the the confidence boost that I can pick the air the bow up, walk out, and the first air out of the bow hits where I'm looking. So it's different for everybody. I, c- I can't answer the question. I can just tell you my opinions on uh, you know how you need to set expectations and and how to have that discipline if you're not wanting to fully commit to it. Yeah, and you know that's all this is is our our opinions and 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 for you coming on here. In talking with us, you know, you've, you know, taken on the same journey as we have is, is trying to get out and, and share our opinions with as many people as, as we can, uh, you know, to try and inspire them. And I just think it's nice to have realistic expectations. I mean, for, you know, everything that that's out there with social media today, 
you know, everybody shoots a 140 and everybody that shoots a stick bow only kills moose and polar bears and shit like that. So it's, it, like I say, it's not, it isn't all, all roses, you know, at, at some point you have to have somebody to say, all right, well, it's okay to just shoot whatever flies out of the bow when you're getting started. It's okay to, you know, if you want to go out and, and hunt, just be realistic about it. Um, and I think, you know, for, for anybody that's a bow hunter, you've already decided that you're not going to take an animal at 200 yards with a, with a bow. I mean, with a rifle, you could, I feel like every deer that I see with a rifle, I can, or with a bow, I can kill with a rifle, but that dramatically changes when you go from a, a compound bow to a, <laughs> a, a traditional equipment, you know, but, but does I can't it? imagine, but does well, it? relatively speaking, does it really based on what you just said, you can shoot a, a deer with a rifle at 200 yards. You know, if you mm-hmm. pick up the bow, you're cutting that in, in more than half, right? Right. Same thing goes for traditional gear. But again, right. you've, you've got to be willing to, you've got to be willing to accept that you, you just shortened, you made it more intimate. Uh, and I keep going back to that. It, for me, if I see a deer walking by at a hundred yards, I honestly and truly, the last thing that ever comes to my mind is if I'd had a rifle, I could have shot that. That the, what goes through my mind is, okay, how do I figure out how to get in a position where the next time he walks through there, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be waiting on him. It's just, a, again, it's a, I guess it's just a different mentality. And for some that comes after many years. And for some it was, you know, they're all, you know, from the start. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to cut you off there. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I mean, that was the point that I was, that I was making. Um, but it just, I guess the, the difference is, is that there's very few to know people that have killed an, you know, white tails out at a hundred yards. So it doesn't, it doesn't in your mind trigger, like I can probably still make that shot, but with a, an animal at 25 and you've got your, your bow and you're like, I've made that shot once or twice or, or something like that. And I think that that's where people would get in trouble, <laughs> you know, be not being able to be disciplined enough to say, okay, 10 yards is, is it. <laughs> well, and, and it, at, at risk of, you know, we said this up front, you know, some of these questions, who knows who it's going to make mad, but at risk of making other people mad, here's one thing I would say. If you're the, if you're the, if you're a bow hunter today and you see an animal at a hundred yards, a whitetail, not an animal, let's say a whitetail. If you see a whitetail at a hundred yards and, and you can't talk yourself out of making that shot, please don't convert to traditional. It's not for you yet. It may be later, <laughs> right. but it's, it's not for right. you today. Um, because that's, that's a, I wish I'd kept a log of every animal that I've had at, at 22 yards that I, that everything else was perfect, but I would not take the shot because it was, it was farther away. And I won't say 22, let's say 25. Um, it was just one of those, it's, it's close, but it's just not close enough. And, and I let it walk. And I would love to tell you that they all bother me, but they don't. Um, you know, the only time they bothered me was when I was trying to commit myself to hunting with a, a traditional bow. I still had a combo, a compound bow hanging on a hook at my house. And I would have, you know, deer all the time walking by between 20 and 30 yards. And it would, it would bug me. It would irritate me. And I would try to figure out how do I get closer and how do I get closer. After I saw my first cedar shaft with a, a Stoss 160 broadhead slip through uh, behind the shoulder of a, a pretty large whitetail doe at 20 yards, it it honestly has never gone through my mind again because that that rush and that adrenaline that I felt, I feel it every time and I want it every time. If I can't have it, then I haven't, I just, I don't want to take the shot. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Like we're, we're running up on an hour here and I know you've got some things to do and, uh, you know, Walter Lee is going to give me a bunch of crap because 
I <laughs> really do bust his balls hard about cutting it off at an hour. Um, but let's talk a little bit about maybe one of your more memorable hunts with a, with a longbow and, um, you know, kind of, I guess the differences between animals that you've harvested with, uh, uh, you know, whether it be a muzzleloader or a pistol or, or a compound bow to, you know, you kind of alluded to that, but maybe, a, a one of the more memorable hunts with, uh, traditional equipment. Uh, wow. That, that's, that's honestly kind of tough, but I'll, I'll, we could, we could do this for two hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> And I'll, I, so before I go down that path with regards to your comment about Walter, you know, guys, I'll, I'm, I'll hop on here anytime you want to chat. We, we've, we've talked mechanics on this one. Maybe, maybe we do another one and we, we talk about hunting stories. Uh, I'd love mm-hmm. to share more of those with you guys, but, um, I would say, God, they're all memorable. I mean, just about every animal I've taken with traditional gear, I can still pretty much tell you the entire story. Um, okay, let's let's do this one. So, um, not only do I love hunting with traditional gear, but I've actually, I will I will typically take an animal from the ground every year with with traditional gear, and and it took a long time to get to the point where where I felt confident enough that I could do that consistently. Um, it's been four, five, five or six years ago now. Um, one of the uh, public land areas that i hunt there's a there's a large uh creek bottom right uh, right right near where this this pretty large creek actually flows into a, a larger river and when i say large creek it's you can get across it with you know 16 inch high rubber boots but you have to be careful doing so I mean, it's a it's pretty 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 wide and pretty deep creek and there's a large uh, creek bottom that is always covered up with sign. And the problem is people won't hunt it, bec- or at the time people wouldn't hunt it a lot because a lot of the, the trees were fairly small and it was really kind of hard to hunt it with a uh, tree stand. And along this creek, there's a, a very thick um, growth of river cane and i'm not sure if you guys i don't even know if you have river cane up in michigan but it looks like bamboo except it just doesn't get as big um a a very large river cane shaft at the ground it might be might be an inch maybe a little bit larger in diameter um but along the edge of this this river cane there was just a a very large um well-used uh travel corridor and I, I I studied it and I studied it and I would I would hang trees on the edge and and watch the the deer and and how they were moving through the area and I finally came up with this great plan that I was going to actually go and and trim out two shooting lanes in this river cane and then clear out an area large enough that I could actually just back up in this river cane uh, and hunt from it. So I did, and when I actually started getting in there, I realized really quick how hard that stuff is to to cut and, and do anything with. It wants to shatter more than it does cut. I ended up only getting myself about six yards uh, into this river cane, and I, I set up. And I can't remember if it was the first day or the second day I hunted it, but I was, I was sitting and I caught movement off to my left, and I actually sat there and watched a, a decent whitetail buck for, for public land come moving down this trail. Um, he passed by the the first shooting lane that I had, and there was just no way I could draw because he would have caught the movement. Um, so I waited. He passed. He got to the second one, and I shot. That was the first deer I shot on the ground. Uh, with a traditional bow and it was a total of about seven yards so that was exciting enough and it believe it or not it gets better so i shot i shot the deer it took off running um i watched it go down and i'm sitting there trying to get my 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 nerves in order i was basically had just come unglued and i caught movement again and believe it or not i had a, a mature coyote basically come and cross that same um, 
creek bottom coming straight at me and actually looked directly at me through the first uh, sight window and was like he was I don't know if he could see me or if he was just trying to figure out if something was there that wasn't supposed to be there. And he finally turned and started heading the way the buck had come from. And I slipped an arrow through that coyote at the same seven yards, seven, eight <laughs> yards uh, from that, from that river cane. And I, I'll be honest, I've hunted river cane quite a bit since then. Um, but that's one, I mean, it, you know, there, there, again, there's, there's so many uh, because every one of them just seems so much more more special than anything I'd ever done before and I know that sounds a bit corny but so many times you're just you know I've had white tails pass by so close I could I could hear them breathing um you know you, when you can see the when you can see their their hair ripple because they you know they they're they've got a fly or something that's that's irritating and you you not not shaking but you see a muscle ripple down the I mean all those little things is just what makes it so amazing to me to actually be out there hunting and, and trying to get that close pretty much every time I go out there. Yeah, and I think I think for me that's the allure of I mean, if if you if I were to draw up a a hunt, you know, with a a traditional bow, it would be from the ground and it would be close. I've never shot a deer uh with a bow from the ground. I know that John has. Um but you know, even, even with a compound, like you're saying, it's like a little bit different. I think, I don't know, just the drawback and release, like the instinctual, you know, all the things that have to happen so, so perfectly. And to be that close and to be on the ground, it's like, it's almost like your turkey with your compound last year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hey. Some things I can never live down. I can, <laughs> I can tell you that, but five yards, right. <laughs> pull back fire <laughs> but that's why they call it hunting john not killing <laughs> well I, yeah well, i mean i know we're both kind of getting ready to go down this trad uh road but i told adam he was talking about well i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna go turkey hunting with my trad bow this year i'm like no no i'm gonna tell you right now you're gonna kill one with your compound first because you gotta you gotta redeem that <laughs> but you owe it to the turkeys. Come on. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, no, I mean, I really appreciate having you on here, Stephen. We'll definitely uh, get you back on here. Like, we wanted a traditional 101 start to finish, and uh, I think you did an excellent job um, as far as just kind of telling people, like, not necessarily what not to do, but what's necessary and what isn't. I mean, kind of cutting out all the BS. Right, because that's kind of like what, you know, when Ad and I started talking about I'm like, man, I, I know what's going to happen if I go down this road. I'm just going to, it's going to it's gonna be bad. I'm going to get overwhelmed, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so your information on just getting a bow, get it to shoot, you know, get, don't worry about what the arrow's weight are as long as they shoot good out of the bow and they're safe. Just get out and shoot, and, you know. And I think the most important thing that, that, that he said there that we kind of overlooked is he, he said, make sure you're shooting it well and you're having fun doing it. Yeah. Because, I mean, the the hashtag of the struggle stick, it seems like it would be like it's <laughs> counterintuitive, right? <laughs> you know what? I can't tell you how many people got up in arms in the traditional community about that stupid hashtag. <laughs> and, 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 and I'll be honest, personally, I think people, I think everybody should embrace it. And here's why everybody that has tried traditional knows that feeling. I don't care who you are because there are going to be days. Look, you can, you can be shooting and you can be on six days of the week. And that seventh day you walk out there and you won't be able to, you won't be able to put an arrow anywhere near where you're looking. That's, that's the struggle. That's the beauty of it. It's something that you, you, you you might semi master, but you're never going to master it a hundred percent of the time. That's what makes it so appealing. But at the same time, it can be a struggle. I don't know it, that whole thing. It, it was just amazing to me to watch how many people just got completely pissed off um, <laughs> over a stupid hashtag 
because they and what they were trying to do was say well it's not that hard and you're going to be pushing people away meanwhile they didn't realize they were pushing people away by making a big deal over nothing um (laughs) so anyway yeah uh i get what you're saying the most important thing though is to have fun if you're a that that can also be a challenge though if you're if you're a gearhead like me that just has to figure out everything I probably spent way too much time focusing on all the little details when I should have just been having fun at the start too. But again, it's different for everybody. I would just say, don't get the, again, don't get the wire wrapped around the axle unless that's just what you enjoy doing. Get out there and shoot that. I can't tell you how many people have just shown up. Um, I think I talked to you about this a little bit, Adam, um, the, the Southern outdoorsman guys, uh, Jacob mm-hmm. Myers, yep. Jacob Myers, uh, and I thank the world of Jacob. I still have not um, met Andrew yet, but Jacob actually moved to Atlanta for a short period of time. And while he was here, um, I told him, I said, you've got to come out to our local uh, trad club and just shoot with us. And I finally convinced him and I actually told him, I said, I've got a bow. I'll bring it for you. It's probably a little bit heavy, but you're you know you're a young guy you're strong i have no doubt you can shoot it we had to run the guy off i mean we had pulled the targets and when we got back up to and put the targets back in storage he was still down on the on the uh practice range he shot all day long just loved it um loved it so much i finally just told him you know what keep the bow take it home with you um you know shoot it Uh, you don't even have to worry about giving it back to me um so it's it's it it can be addicting, man. I mean, it's just you, you get out and, and don't just, if you try it, here's the only thing I, I will add to that. If you try it, just don't, just don't do it in solitude. Solitude's great, but you're missing out so much on the experience unless you're getting out and, and spending time with like-minded individuals that can help you as well. But, um, so much of it's just the fellowship too. Yeah. And I know you guys have that in the, in the compound world too, but it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Well, that was one thing that struck me is I I couldn't have met a nicer group of people at the at that expo, and I I didn't I don't think I went in there, you know, with the chip on my shoulder or anything like that, or that everybody was going to be these elitists. But I mean, everyone that I talked to, you know, kind of had the same journey. You know, they didn't all start out shooting, you know, just self bows and, and, and everything like that. And, and a lot of them did shoot, you know, basically everything still that they enjoyed, but what they, what they were passionate about was, was the traditional stuff and, and they would help you in any way that they could. Uh, I would totally echo that statement is that, you know, if you, I mean, even with podcasting, if you don't find people that are into the same things that you are, that you can bounce ideas off of or the same struggles that you've went through, then you're really missing out. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, a, that's a hundred percent correct. So, so let me tell you a little story and I can actually, cause I know you guys are, are, have the, have the explicit rating. We, I don't own traditional outdoors, we, but I can, <laughs> I can actually fully tell you this story and, and really speak my mind and you'll, you'll probably get a kick out of it. So before I tell it, I'll start out by saying, here's what I would tell you. Whenever you're on social media and you are, you run into that person or persons there, there can sometimes be many on one thread. Um, when you, when you think about, or this thought starts entering your mind that this is just another elitist, you can probably just replace that with asshole and move on. <laughs> um, because, you know, it. I would tell you don't have the elitist, me- and this is for anybody, this isn't just you, Adam, don't have the elitist mentality about the traditional archer community because of one or two, um, which is hard to do. In any in any group, it's hard not to focus on those, those few that just really get under your skin. But, as a trad guy who's been doing this for many years, 2018, I did something that I had actually wanted to do for quite a long time and just had never made myself spend the time in the woods to do it. I shot a, I shot a, a, a buck with a primitive bow, self bow. When I say a primitive self bow, this is a Eastern Woodland style 
bend through the handle. It's basically a stick with a string on it. When you when you pull it back, you can feel the the, the bow bending in you, in the palm of your hand. There's no there's no riser on it. Um, was shooting that bow, a wooden arrow, and I had plastic knocks on the arrow, and I had a Magnus broadhead on the on the business end of that wooden arrow. Later that, I don't remember if it was later that day or the next day, I made a post on Facebook about my first primitive buck, which I was extremely proud of. And it felt a a huge amount of uh, accomplishment. I shot this deer on the ground, natural cover. Um, When he walked by me, he was at six yards. When I shot him, he was about eight or nine. Um, And I had one guy that I've actually known for many years, just got all in my business on Facebook chastising me how that was not a primitive kill because I used a plastic knock and a metal broadhead. So assholes are everywhere and (laughs) you, you, you just have to recognize them as being a proctologist dream, a walking, talking (laughs) rectum and going about your business. I mean, you just, you, you can't let them get under your skin because to be perfectly honest, the only, the only reason that gentleman did what he did was because he's got some kind of gap in his soul that makes it to where he has to tear other people down. Stay away from those people. I don't care if it's in traditional or anywhere. When you identify them, just stay away from them. Uh, it's the best thing you can do. The traditional community is full of great people that will give you give you the bow out off their rack to go out and shoot. Uh, they'll do anything that they can to help you and see you successful. And those individuals just they aren't worth your time at all. <laughs> yeah, they they're a dime a dozen here in the uh, <laughs> in the compound world and in the world in general too. Um, <laughs> but. Man, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, and taking the time. We'll have to do this again. And, and now with that uh, that uh, less than explicit rating on, on your show, you can come on here and you can bring all your <laughs> listeners over here and you can, we can get the real dirt. Uh, but but for our listeners who are just hearing you for the first time, where can everybody follow along with uh, everything that you're doing? So uh, traditional outdoors podcast, uh, we're pretty much on every platform just like you guys. The website is traditionaloutdoors.com. Um, we also have, uh, the traditional outdoors YouTube channel would love for people to describe, to subscribe there. Um, I'm actually in the process of really started hoping to ramp some things up. I've got uh, quite a few things, uh, instructional type, uh, content that I'm, I'm really going to start pulling together. Hopefully next week, I'm doing a, a hog hunt, um, down in South Georgia next week. And I'm going to be carrying all the equipment along and, and trying to do some instructional stuff during the day when when I'm not out uh, uh, still hunting for, for pigs. So that's pretty much us in a nutshell. You can, you, if you can search traditional outdoors, you should be able to find us. Well, awesome, Steve. I really appreciate it, and I think that's all we got for today. So, Well, gentlemen, I, I appreciate you having me on. I, I, hope I didn't hope I didn't ramble too much and would look forward to being on at any time. And like I told you at the expo, Adam, we just got to figure out, you know, how we can how we can bring you guys on to our show and what the topic will be. And I'd, I'd love to uh, I'd love to have you guys on as guests too. Sure, anytime. Oh, you just give us a call. We will be the what not to do episode of the <laughs> traditional outdoors podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan, guys. I really do appreciate it. All right, All right. we'll see.